Thank you for listening to the Matt's Movie Reviews Podcast, available on Podbean, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, and Stitcher. Also, please follow Matt's Movie Reviews on Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn, Reddit, Instagram, Twitter, and Rumble. And of course, be sure to visit mattsmoviereviews.net for the latest reviews, top 10 lists, and more. Now, on to the show. Is there a life after death? Is there an invisible world that surrounds us? Who's the name again? Frederick Ladbrook, post-mortem photographer and my associate, Emma Wicks. Oh, you're the corpse people. William Colcott. <laughs> Killed a lot of people. <laughs> I would say it could have been nearly 28. Ooh, charming fellow. Set the camera up for me, would you? Very good. Save us, Father. There's evil down here. What is it that's down there? What did you see? We would like to offer our services as paranormal investigators. If there is anyone there who would like to make contact, please make yourself known. Switch off that thing, now. I need all you have on this William Colcott. Show yourself to him. Hello and welcome to the Matt's Movie Reviews Podcast. I am your host, Matthew Perkovich, and this is episode number 542. Out now on video on demand and digital is The Gates, a horror thriller set in 1890s London, where a recently executed serial killer haunts the dark corners of a brutal prison. Brought in to confront this evil is a trio of ghost hunters who must overcome their own insecurities to tackle this evil force. Starring John Rhys Davies, Richard Brake, and Michael Yari, The Gates is a moody gothic horror filled with rich photography and fine performances. And joining me now is the director and co-writer of The Gates, Mr. Stephen Hall. Stephen, I thank you so very much for joining me. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here. You know, what's really interesting to me with this movie and what fascinates me, and something that I think fascinates me just in the context of horror cinema, is that era of is that Victorian era in uh, in the UK, especially in regards to relationship with the supernatural, is really interesting time back then because the Western world was like underwent this kind of crisis of faith, kind of like post Darwin, where like the science was all of a sudden like caught up with with the church and God, and like there was this conflict, and then one started to unsurp the other, um, and it just became this kind of ripe playground for like all different type of mystics and supernatural stuff and ghost hunters and what have you. Was that era, that stuff that was going on, Dan, was that something that really kind of like um, spoke to you as a filmmaker story so that you wanted to set this movie in, in that period? Um, and also just the, just the fact that so many great top horror movies being based in that period as well would have went a long way in, in, in making this decision as well. Of course, it's 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 kind of this this time where the kind of magic is nearly kind of something that that could be accepted the same way that 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 kind of technology is uh, it's the same way kind of supernatural elements can kind of still be that kind of accepted thing that right we've got electricity now this magical force that that we can't see but it it, it, it I suppose magically makes light appear and all these other kind of things that that I think are 
uh, are part and parcel with that time. And kind of what, what we wanted to do was, was to kind of create um, a version of that Victorian era that kind of m- maybe allowed um, spiritualism and and the supernatural to kind of have a little bit more of a foothold um, and allow that to kind of breathe a little bit more. Um, I think like allowing that as a backdrop really allowed us to kind of stretch a little bit and have some fun with what those elements can be having an having a a paranormal society paranormal wasn't even a word at that time <laughs> it wasn't actually a thing um but you know kind of a, a, allowing that some space to kind of grow and to think and to kind of uh explore was an awful lot of fun it really was in that exploration i'm just curious the characters in your film that john rice davies plays of frederick and elena plays of, of emma um, they like these kind of uh, ghost hunters in a sort of way in that they they take the the science and they mix it with the supernatural and they create all these different type of gadgets and stuff. Kind of like, I guess it would be like the, the period version of what you might see today in Ghost Hunters Reality TV, right? These little kind of devices and gadgets that they have. Did you find um, in any of your research that ki- that kind of stuff, people were dabbling in that stuff back then with the emergence of the sciences? Or, or is the stuff we're seeing in a movie more kind of like you know, more on, on, on the fantastical side of that kind of approach to uh, the supernatural and ghost hunting in that time? It, it It's definitely more on the fantastic side. But although in saying that, um, there were absolutely um, people that were that were dabbling in that side, but it was more so from the side of the 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 kind of shysters and people trying to try to make a fast buck, and again using that 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 explosion of, uh, I suppose of of spiritualism in that time to kind of um, falsely contact the dead and kind of put on a show for everybody, and also that's kind of where I wanted the audience and. Fred and Emma to kind of sit with Lucian's uh, introduction to the story. I kind of wanted it to be that it's, you know, is he for real? And like, is he is he is he somebody that's kind of trying to make a uh, uh, a quick buck? And that's also, I suppose, where some of the other characters are kind of sitting, going, you know, is this is this something that I can actually tangibly believe in? But if it is, do I want to actually think that it could be real? Because that's a little bit worse than than if it's just a uh just a way to try and make a little bit of money i suppose and the other thing that's really interesting to me watching the movie is that there's these kind of conflicting philosophies in regards to spiritual spirituality um the supernatural and which one is the best one to uh to confront this evil so you had the character of lucian just talked about played by Michael gary he's kind of like this clairvoyant we spoke about frederick and emma and then you have the the chaplain of the of the jail, um, the uh, Bishop Gate uh, prison, and he is like very much like you know these guys are heretics and they're just going to make things worse. And maybe to his credit, he might have something to say there, but maybe not. I uh, don't want to give away too much, but it's just in how like these three different elements come from d- three different schools of thought and are kind of clashing at the same time. I'd imagine in that time when all these different kind of like. Uh, things like clairvoyancy and the, the emergence of the Ouija board and all that stuff that at the church at the time, uh, which for such a long time had the uh, the dominance over regards to spiritual matters, they, would, they wouldn't have liked that at all. And it would have been a, a real kind of confrontation in regards to a lot of that kind of stuff. Totally. And like, that's, that's where Father Matthews is coming from. It's, he's desperately trying to hold on to the situation. And he, you know, he obviously gets attacked and gets sidelined kind of early. But he spends the whole time, like, I suppose, working with David Pierce, who played Father Matthews, our our approach was that he's seething, he is angry, and it becomes more of a kind of a, a stand your ground even above what may be the right thing to do or what might be the sensible thing. It's It's got to be his way. And that's where he kind of, I suppose, it's it's not even gains the courage, but kind of gets fed up, throws his toys out of the pram, so to speak, and wants to insert himself into the situation. It seems to me uh, that he, yeah, it seems to me that he exchanged his faith for ego. It's not so much that um, he feels that um, what's going on is a uh, um, direct attack towards God or his faith, but it, it, it's uh, towards his own uh, own power set that he used to have. And all of a sudden, he's kind of like just uh, pushed to the side there. It's a real kind of interesting um, little dynamic that's happening there. Um, 
I want to talk about the, the cast in your film and, and someone who I, I haven't mentioned yet is um, Richard Brake. And, um, you know, what I love about horror and horror cinema and the history of horror is that throughout that genre, you have these great faces that are just like, just show up everywhere from Peter Lorre to Michael Berryman to everyone in between, right? And then, then you get someone like a Richard Brake where he's the type of guy, and I think what works, works so well um, in regards to the gates, both the movie and the marketing materials. Well, you can put his face on there and you can have yeah. him put that devilish grin and you know all of a sudden this guy means business because the character and look at the character, there's a viciousness and there's a there's a sense, tangible kind of sense of like the the, the evil that comes from that. And I think um, the casting of him in that role is just so essential to making um, this movie work. So what was it like um, casting him for the movie and working with him as well? Because um, his presence in the film, even when he's not there, um, he, the shots of his face and kind of like the different con- contortions and the and the blood and everything else, I think they really stick with in people's consciousness throughout the movie. And when in the way it's used throughout the film, I think it's uh, really clever on your part. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, yeah. Richard is like he's a legend in every sense of the word like you know and and he's he was so amazing to work with like our our prep in that was that like he only has nine lines in the film Mm. so these nine lines have to be really 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 impactful and we we work to make sure that every time he opens his mouth and every time he doesn't as well that it, it it really really says something and like yeah Richard has this just amazing ability to strike fear into you. And like, the funny thing is he is the nicest guy. Like he really is the nicest guy. And like, you know, you'll have great chats about music and movies and things like that. But then the second that he steps into that, into that mode, he just embodies absolute fear. He's, he's fantastic. And like, you know, in, in terms of casting that role, because we only have those, nine lines it it really needs to be somebody that can that can hold like you were saying throughout the film you know he's 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 only physically in a few pieces of the film we'll say but that that presence need to be felt so that that opening um opening scene and uh, it's not too much of a spoiler it's in the trailer but his his death scene as well um they have to really 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 make an impact so that that moment stays with you and his personality and his 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 lack of fear in the face of death as well has to follow you. Mm. So it was important that we got somebody that can instantly kind of nearly have a shortcut to to make you feel that way. And Richard just strikes fear into your heart without saying anything, just staring straight into your soul. He's he's fantastic. And speaking of uh, movie legends, John Rhys Davies in the movie. I don't. I can't think of anyone else um, that's been in the business for as long as he has at his age. He is now. He's as prolific as he is. I mean, he's popping out like three, or four movies a, a year. Um, I just saw him like in the new Indiana, Indiana Jones films like a couple of weeks yeah. ago, um, and he's, he's terrific in this movie too. And I think it's really distinct about him above anything else um, is his voice. I absolutely mm-hmm. love listening to him. He's the type of guy that if he was, does an audio book, and I'm sure he does that too, um, he yeah. like you want to listen to his voice throughout the film. What's it like when you have an actor like that bringing voice to your words that you write down on the, on the page? Um, and when you have a, a, a script like yours um, where there is quite a bit of dialogue in it, do you like to rehearse? Do you have time to rehearse? Or is it just about... Um, getting on the set and then letting these veteran actors do what they do. And I'm sure when you have someone like John Rice Davies, you have all the trust in the world that he'll be able to pull off a lot of the a lot of the dialogue that's in this movie. We we didn't get much of an opportunity to, to rehearse. Yeah, as as you can imagine, um, you know, we were absolutely reaching very far to try and make something like this and the budget that we had. Um, but what we did do is we we did a lot of kind of character work leading up to it, and and John was fantastic. He he um he really kind of brought a lot of thought to the character, you know, and and especially to the time as well, with you know with the explosion of different um different schools of thought, like you like you were speaking about earlier, Darwinism, and we had you know um 
discoveries of infrared and ultraviolet and all all that kind of that 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 kind of explosion of um uh, of science really that was that was really where john was very interested and he wanted to kind of really ground frederick as as a man of science but a man of kind of curiosities as well and i really really loved what he brought to the character in that way as well because it really grounded him and it allowed the audience to kind of stand on his side quite a bit as well when some of the more fantastical elements or some of the kind of raise your eye raise your eyebrow moments that lucian may have we can side with frederick and he can be our window for the audience um and and then yeah like in terms of having i think that voice say the words that tim and i wrote like it's it's incredible like I, you know, I I grew up watching this amazing man, and like <laughs> Lord of the Rings, Indiana Jones, Sliders. You know, like yeah. he's he just he's incredible, and like I will never, <laughs> I'll never be able to kind of shake off that that first moment of just seeing him completely step into Frederick, because Frederick. Frederick on the page kind of is is a little bit more of um, a reserved kind of character, and when John came in, John kind of completely altered where um, where I, where I was at with him. He's just, <laughs> I suppose he's John. Really, he's kind of the only way to say it. He's, he's incredible. <laughs> um, you know. You mentioned before in regards to this is like an independent feature in a lot of ways and it has a small budget, but the look of the film, the, the feel of it, see, is big, it's rich. There's a sense of style to the film and a thickness to the photography and the imagery as well that I thought was really well done, costume design as well. Um, now, it is set in London, but it's actually shot in, in County Cook in Ireland. And yes. what I'm really curious about, that the setting of the film, the prison, is that a real place? Where did you find that place? Um, and did you have to look for a lot of different places or did you already know of some places in County Cook that you could um, shoot this film? Because I thought that the setting of the movie, the prison itself, um, which to me is, is such a fun playground for a horror movie, you got caged rooms, you got these dark corners, you got these different places to go. Um, I, I mean, it's a really, I think it's really ripe for, for um, uh, a horror movie. And, Kind of surprised, actually. I was trying to think of where uh, any other horror, horror movie set in a prison or a ghost story, and I can't really think of any. Uh, I'm sure there are. Um, people will probably correct me if I'm wrong, but um, I think it's a really kind of a suitable uh, setting for for a ghost story, um, especially the one uh, that's in your movie. Yeah, the court jail was amazing. Like we we actually didn't have to look too far because I think I think court jail was the second place that we viewed, and I was just like, this is. Like it's like we wrote it based on the geography of the jail. Mm. Um, it, it was just it was perfect. And as you kind of walked through the jail, it was like, okay, so there's the governor's office, there's the reception, there's the cell block. Everything was just there. There was, like, with the exception of a morgue, that was the only thing that we couldn't find there. So we actually shot that in a um, in a kind of a medieval uh, tourist attraction that we have in County Clare, um, and they have a turn of the century like uh 1810 kind of uh street that's there so we were able to use that for some of our street exteriors our pub and we turned the school into a morgue <laughs> um so yeah we we uh uh we really enjoy shooting um in cork though because cork like it's the kind of space that you walk in and you can you can feel something you, you can feel something emanating from the walls there's there's a sense that kind of heaviness in there um, and that really, really added to just to the atmosphere for me as a director. It it kind of provided that shortcut that I was talking about earlier, that you could you could feel it, you could see it on screen. And then like with with Bershie's, um Bershie's cinematographer, um, he's he's just amazing. He has such an eye and like really it's it was such a strange thing because usually I have shot a lot of the projects that I've directed. Um, I've, I've very much so had my hands on that side of things and then being able to have Bershi come in and just speak the same language and allow me to completely switch off that need to, <laughs> to kind of get my hands on the camera and just 
blow me away. He was he was incredible and great to work with. Um, but yeah, the jail, the jail itself actually is uh, an open uh, uh, tourist attraction. Um, and it was it was actually open for portions while we were shooting as well. So it was definitely an interesting thing to kind of try and and balance with guests uh, leaving at four o'clock and us arriving in at four o'clock and making that change over from, you know, a, a, a tour guide and a headset to uh, all of a sudden Richard Brake in full undead <laughs> look. <laughs> it was great. But uh, yeah, Cork Joe was amazing. The Matt's Movie Reviews podcast is brought to you by T Public. T Public is the world's largest marketplace for independent creators to sell their work on the highest quality merchandise. With over 1.2 million designs, T Public is sure to have something you will love. The Matt's Movie Reviews podcast is brought to you by Amazon, the world's leading online store. Amazon is your first stop to buy a wide range of products at competitive prices with fast delivery times. Amazon is also a world-class entertainment hub that includes Prime Video, Audible, Twitch, Amazon Music, and more. Sign up with Amazon today and experience the best in online shopping and entertainment. Please support Matt's movie reviews on Patreon. Get access to exclusive content, request movie reviews and top 10 lists, and help support my work. Please click on the Patreon link in the description below. When you're talking with uh, with Borshi, um, Borshi what what was uh, I think it could be uh, Boiner. Boiner. Okay. And, and yeah. apologies to Borshi. <laughs> Uh, uh, Bershi, if you're listening, my last name's Perkovic, so people mess my name up all the time too, so it's all good. Um, when you're talking to him about how you approach um, doing blackness, dark, <laughs> the dark photography in a movie, um, I'm really curious, do you guys reference any other films or is there a, a tone of what how you want to approach that kind of photography? Because there's a great scene in the movie, and again, I don't want to give away too much, but there's a scene where we're looking at a corridor and out of the mm-hmm. corridor kind of comes Richard Break, And I've just thought the way that he kind of comes out of that darkness and the blackness was just so well done. And I love watching, I don't know what it is, but I just love watching. Um, see, there's a difference where you watch films where they are dark and where there's great dark photography. Um, when I watch, like, you know, the, photog- the cinematography of Gordon Willis, um, he did The Godfather. I watched a film of his I hadn't seen before called Presumed Innocent for the first time, like uh, a week ago. And I just, I just love the way he approaches the dark colors as well. Um, when it comes to how you and Borshi want, want to approach those dark colors in the dark tones, um, is it other cinematographers, does it reference other movies that you reference? And how do you go about getting those pitch black, black tones so well done? Because I just thought that was a really kind of real strength in the movie because sometimes I think um, photographers and directors, get the darkness um in their films and it just it's just a little too much um there's no kind of character in it which might sound weird because you know darkness is obscured the absence of this stuff but to me the best dark photography in the movies have a certain character or thickness to them which i thought that um this movie really had in it yeah i'd like our approach was uh not to shy away from it sorry not not to shy away from it um like the I suppose the tendency for for a lot of uh, modern cinematography is to kind of expose for everything and pick your look in post. Mm. You know, like if we want shadows, we can decide whether we want them to be you know crushed or we can kind of have, have a little bit of lightness. We wanted it to f- to feel like it was film because you know it's 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 period film, so we wanted to have to have as close to that kind of look as possible, um, and for it to be very very kind of unpretty and unapologetic in that way so you know we really leaned into grain um we we lit the parts that we wanted to be lit and i mean i suppose that's a that that's kind of an approach with indie film as well that you know you you show the things you want to show and you don't show the things that you don't want to show um so yeah using darkness was definitely a really um a really important theme in it as well and i think having um have more of that that film kind of element allowed us to to really lean into it and films like um uh, like the woman in black was actually a very big influence because um that was that was that kind of moment where 
there was still there was still horror being shot on film and it wasn't a kind of an exercise in how good your color grade is later on they were like you know, they weren't afraid to bake your look in there on set and actually like we didn't shoot raw we shot in prores um because we we wanted our look to be what our look was um and yeah that's that that's definitely something that i know everybody chases the the film look but for us you know we shot in, on anamorphic lenses and i think that that really helped us kind of again have that shortcut to being like right this this feels like something tangible you know um and then uh uh carol our colorist she was amazing and really kind of helped to 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 bring that look in um just that little extra 10 percent that we needed and then to absolutely positively obliterate it with green in the best possible way <laughs> mm. well it looks it looks really terrific i think um uh, having watched the film, because I really, like I said, I really like when the, the blacks in the, in the, the colours um, of the blacks in a in a movie, especially a horror movie, do have that really kind of like film kind of look. Because I like when I mentioned Gordon Willis, of course, he was shooting on film mm. back then. So, and I love it when that kind of thing is um, not necessarily replicated, but at least you know that character in that field is still there, and I think he goes really succeeded in doing that. Um, you just talked before about when. Um, you shot in Cork Prison that the, the walls kind of were speaking to you. There was a history there. Um, and I'm just curious, as yourself as, a, as an Irishman um, filming in Ireland, is that something that's kind of like very kind of like um, that you as a storyteller and a filmmaker, that the, the history of your country, the essence of it, is something that really kind of uh, inspires the way that you approach film um, in storytelling? I mean, I'm here in Australia. We're still a relatively young country, and we can you know, look to other things. But usually, we're we're looking to other influences outside of our walls. Where in a place like Ireland, um, where it's been around for so long, and so many things have happened there um, over the last, you know, how many how many years? Um, there's a it, it's just right there in the soil. It's right there in the ether. And I'm just curious, especially when it comes to put, doing genre films like like you do, um, how much of an influence that is. Um, the history of your country um, and all the things that happen. And also, it's also a strong history of storytellers as well um, in your country as well. How much does that influence you um, in the way that you approach um, your stories and your filmmaking? Oh, hugely. Like, you know, there's, uh, I suppose, not to not to kind of use the same term again, but there's a weight in the air, you know? Mm. <laughs> like, I think there's there's a history that every Irish person carries with them. And I think using that that history and that kind of weight allows it kind of allows you to tap into something that's that's a little bit greater than yourself, you know. Um, and especially in this, you know, I'm I'm an Irish person person telling a kind of a I suppose an English kind of a story as well. Um, and we've we've got a few Irish characters in there, um, but nearly all the cast were Irish. Um, it's really just Richard and john who are welch and um elena who's uh italian american uh, everybody else was irish so you know there's <laughs> there is that kind of duality of um especially around that time as well you know it, like it, it it really kind of speaks to where ireland was at where england was at and then the the presence of of where we were shooting when we were shooting as well weren't lost on us um so for me going like going forward into my next projects as well um yeah it's it's really great to be able to to have the weight of well i suppose irishness in behind us that's always something that that i, I suppose i know people say look at the irish and that's and I, I can feel irish people wanting to to kill me for even saying that for, uh, phrase <laughs> but we definitely have something um that kind of gu guides us i suppose and i think our history our sensibilities it all comes from a place of pain but ireland has a great humor that we can kind of turn that pain into uh into art and that can be mm -hmm. something to scare you something to make you laugh something to move you um so i kind of like all of those things um, but maybe more so a little bit, something to scare you. Um, final question. When I watch the end of the film, I can't help but feel there could be potential for a follow-up, a sequel, 
I've uh, listened to a, a um, interview with John Rice Davies, and it's something that he feels very strongly about as well. Uh, there could be a potential for a series here. Of course, it's very early days. I mean, this film uh, only just came out, I think it was like the 27th of June. Um, yep. but it, it came out on a video domain and digital. Um, do you and Tim, uh, Tim Reynolds, your co-writer, do you guys already have an outline of potential follow-ups as where the story could go? Um, and when would you know for sure you think that that would be something that um, you could dive into again? Because um, I think just uh, the the trio of those three uh, main characters played by John and 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 uh, Michael and Elena, I think it's a really cool dynamic the three of them have there. And I, I love to see them on screen again. And, and it's clearly unfinished business. So I'm just really curious on your part. Uh, uh, what are your thoughts on that and whether there is potential for that to happen? Yeah, like uh, Tim and I very early on had that feeling as well. And yeah, Tim Tim originally wrote the script um, and uh, he had it for a few years. And then I came on as a writer as well. And um, we really worked out, I suppose, where where things could go after this. Um, we don't want to don't want to spoil anything. Um, but yeah, there's there's definitely scope to step forward and move into somewhere like New York. Very interesting time in New York around that time. Um, subways are being built, and all kinds of all kinds of interesting things happening that I won't give too much away. Um, but yeah, like I mean, one of the one of the things that kind of t- uh, tickled me pink and made me kind of uh, like just super excited and giddy was that when we were talking to John um, and. Uh, telling him, you know, like, okay, so here's 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 what we see for for the next film. He stopped me and went, "Shall we make a trilogy?" And I kind of just <laughs> went, "Oh, oh my god!" <laughs> well, he knows but what's about that. So. <laughs> exactly, doesn't he? Just <laughs> so, um, so I went, John, your wish is my command. <laughs> but um, no, like he's, you know, he's he's totally. Um, up for it really and uh loved where we wanted to go with his character with the story um and yeah we once once we heard that we thought okay well we better kind of just come up with a rough outline for a third even just so that we have some kind of weight in behind it again um but yeah we're we're definitely working on it um it's it's really cool and it kind of gives us um a framework now to to move forward because now we really have our characters established it's it's obviously so different when you're when you're writing something and then when you direct it and even when you edit it your characters change and bend and flex so much so being able to kind of now know right this is who lucian is this is who frederick is and this is who emma is you know this this is firmly who they are um yeah it gives it gives a great license to be able to go right now if we change the situation and if we if if we give them a new set of obstacles, how do they grow? How do they change? Or how do they stay the same? So um yeah, um in terms of when, uh, that's kind of anybody's guess right now. <laughs> mm. but, you know, it's it's so it's so early days. Um, but we've we've been working on this since we wrapped. So we do have uh we do have quite 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 a good a good bit of groundwork. And because this was independently financed as well, um the people who find that the, the the people who financed it are interested in further stories from these characters so i suppose we just we just gonna have to wait and see how the film does well i think the film's gonna do well i i, I know the trailer itself had a lot of a lot of uh, people talking about an interest and the film itself is really interesting to me because what i really um enjoy about it is that it's a film that really kind of takes its time and it doesn't um I think a, a big criticism a lot of people have about modern horror, or at least the horror of the last 10 years, is that a lot of it relies too heavily on a well-timed formula of quiet, 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 loud, quiet, quiet, loud, you know, that yeah. kind of thing. And I think um, the, what the Gates does is successfully kind of like sidesteps that. Um, and there's this character development and we're getting to know these people. In, and I can't wait to see what where the evolution of these characters go. But before... We do want everyone to know the gates is out now. 
Video on Demand and Digital. I recommend you check it out on a really dark, quiet night. Uh, put put it on. It's really great um, gothic horror. The, the imagery is really, uh, like I said before, just the style of it and the imagery I'm a big fan of. Uh, the performances as well. Richard Brake, uh, you know, scares the living shit out of me while I was watching the film because <laughs> He just, he just, he here has that thing, man. He really does. And um, Stephen, thank you so very much for your time. Congrats with the movie. And um, when that next one gets up and running, um, please get in touch with me. I'd, I'd love to talk to you again. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. This, this, this was excellent. And yeah, I'll definitely get in touch. There's, there's, there's definitely going to be some really exciting, uh, uh, evolve, uh, 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 evolution of the characters. So, thank you so much. Thank you for watching the Matt's Movie Reviews channel. Please subscribe for more reviews, podcast interviews, and exclusive content. Also, if you would like to request a review and support my work, please join my Patreon via the link in the description below.